the gaps in the archive um, with a little bit of innovation and a little bit of science to try and get as much information as we can. So the site where the tooth is located on the north side of the sorry, sorry um, is located on the north side um, of the airfield at Balavent in the Becula, which is in the Western House, an island located uh, between North and South Hewitt, just off the northwest coast of Scotland. The site itself is comprised of at least two Iron Age uh, wheelhouses, a souterrain, um, which is a kind of subterranean storage area, and a small circular structure to the south. It was investigated as part of rescue excavations, which were undertaken in 1956 and 1957 in advance of the construction of a Ministry of Defence rocket range in the area. So survey and excavation was um, undertaken over the entirety of the proposed area of the rocket range, on the behalf of the then Ministry of Public Buildings and Works. Those archaeological sites which were most at risk of destruction were targeted for excavation, and the Hecatua fell into this category. For those of you not familiar with wheelhouse structures, here's a few um, from very similar areas. You've got the Oodle and um, we've got Grimsey wheelhouse there. So, Two separate extra, uh, so yeah, so those not familiar with them, um, the fairly common Iron Age dwellings um, found throughout this area, roughly circular structures with an open central area and the outer part divided into bays using um, walls. And it kind of looks like a wheel, hence its name. Um, the dividing walls can be built directly up against the outer wall or sometimes they have a little, um, a little gap, in which case they're known as island blue houses. So two separate excavations were undertaken at the site. Um, one by James Wallace in uh, between the 27th of July and the 7th of August 1956, and another one by Jack Scott between the 22nd and the 31st of August. So as, um, as far as we understand it, this is why I was very into the letters earlier, um, from all the letters, these excavators, they didn't overlap, um, and they didn't really speak to each other afterwards either. So um, we have a lot of kind of muddled information between the two sites. Um, in the 50 years since the excavation took place, the archive for the site has become very dispersed. Um, with the artifacts and paper archive finding its way into the collections of the National Museums of Scotland, Historic Environment in Scotland, the Kelvin Grove Museum, National Archives of Scotland, and there may also be material from another mound on the site, we have more, which was deposited in Cambridge. The archive comprised the lines, which were split between museums, a post excavation plan for wheelhouse number one. Um, a mid-excavation plan for wheelhouse number two, single section through both of the sites with a massive chunk of middle missing, and um, a draft report and findings from wheelhouse one. But using this information, it was possible to start to reconstruct the methodology of excavation and features within each of the structures. So this is, you can see the second one at the back, which is just crazy how these people didn't talk to each other, but um, you've got, you've got the, the wheelhouse one there in the front. Um, it survived one to three courses high and was heavily affected by the bulldozing activity which took place during the construction of the airport in the 1940s. The so surviving courses suggest a diameter of 9.8 metres and um, uh, yes, an internal area divided into 10 to 11 bays. Entrance located in the southeast of the structure which was accessed through a passage. Um, the internal features include seven burnt areas um, including hearths and a possible central cooking pit and a, um, also a storage tank, um, and a suitor, and you can just see the black blob on the left-hand side, and that's the stairs down the bottom. Um, that was the suitor in entrance. To the, there you go, this is the second one, uh, located about three meters to the north. The structural remains for this wheelhouse are a lot more complex. It's a lot um, more, greater depth of stratigraphy. Um, the plan uh, didn't show any internal features, um, but we know it was roughly 8.8 .8 meters in diameter with about 12 bays. A secondary cell structure was excavated to, um, to the east, so you can see it just popping out at the bottom where you see D10, D11, um, and that we think was deliberately blocked up with the cornstone put, put in um, as a, a possible uh, 
closing deposit. So the biggest problem that we encountered was lack of stratigraphy. We had identified a lot of features in the plan, but not knowing how they related to each other and to the application of the site. So we knew from the photographs that these were complex, especially for wheelhouse number two, um, because the deposits were cheap and there was possible secondary reuse. Um, what we did have was the finds, and um, we also were managed to reconstruct how things were dug. So we knew that wheelhouse number one had been excavated in quadrants. We're fortunate that the location of the finds right down to the deck within the feature had been written on the bags. This meant that even if there was no feature on, on the plan, we knew where it came from. We also know for wheelhouse two, it was excavated in grid squares. I drew these grid squares onto the, onto the plan. Um, and then the bolts were eventually removed. Each of the finds had the date of the excavation together with the grid square. Um, and the find of a notebook was key because it helped us to identify where each grid was located in the trench. So using this information, I created a Harris matrix of the finds rather than of the stratigraphy. And um, then spoke to Tony at Zurich and to our funders, the Zurich Environment Scotland, about the potential of using this matrix together with radiocarbon dating to reconstruct some kind of vertical stratigraphy of the site and start to create an idea of the occupation. Right. Thank you, Lisa. So for our radiocarbon dating program, this really began with us trying to identify samples that could date specific features and contexts, and also samples that would just more generally reflect the timing of activity at these two wheelhouses. We identified 26 samples that matched our criteria and sent these for radiocarbon dating. These samples consisted of wood charcoal, human bone, pottery residue, and animal bone. The samples were about half the samples were located in wheelhouse one, and another half in wheelhouse two, so we had kind of an equal coverage of both. The contexts that were dated, well, there were quite a few different types of contexts that were dated. Uh, some of the contexts, we weren't quite sure what they were, but we submitted multiple samples for most of those just to provide a really secure date. This uh, whole radiocarbon dating program was driven by some pretty specific questions about the settlement. Specifically, what was the precise timing of construction of the wheelhouses? What was the length of their use? And we were, we were really interested in if they were contemporaneous or not. Right here is just an image of the calibrated radiocarbon dates. Unfortunately, just reading those alone can't really answer our questions that were driving our radiocarbon dating program. And what really we ended up doing here was modeling those dates in a Bayesian modeling framework that could provide probabilistic answers to the questions we are interested in, specifically the timing of the structures, the span of their use, and also test, to test ideas about the phasing. Driving the Bayesian modeling program was um, these chi-square tests that we did on contexts that were dated with multiple samples. We ran chi-square tests of the, on these radiocarbon dates to see if they were statistically the same. And some of these, most of these contexts were, and shown right here, two that um, were dated with disarticulated animal bones. So that these dates were more or less the same provided us with pretty good confidence that neither that these bones were not residual, and also they overlapped with the rest of the calibrations, indicating that they date the general phases of activity at the wheelhouses. So they, this chi-square test more or less justifies uh, one aspect of our sample selection strategy. Throughout all of our models, four samples are interpreted as predating, potentially predating their context, which is a TPQ. Two of these are potentially curated samples. One is a cattle bone that did not pass a chi-square test and is the oldest date from the site, so it appears to just be some old bone that was kicking around. Another one is a pig bone with a partial marine diet, and this actually might be an okay date, but because some of its carbon is marine and terrestrial, it's kind of difficult to calibrate. So right now, we are interpreting it as a TPQ in our models. And about these models, not just one model was created, four were created to exhaust the full range of possibilities 
for how to interpret these radiocarbon dates. And the creation and comparison of multiple models is a process known as sensitivity analysis. The first model focus ex focuses exclusively on wheelhouse one. This model assumes all of the radiocarbon dates from wheelhouse one were part of a uniform phase of activity. These samples were ordered in the model to match the interpretation of phasing Lisa derived from the archival analysis. This model estimates that wheelhouse one was constructed in the second century BC and that activity associated with wheelhouse one ended sometime in the first century BC or first century AD. And finally, this model estimates that wheel, the act, span of activity at wheelhouse one lasted anywhere from about 100 to 300 years. Model two focuses exclusively on wheelhouse two and orders the radiocarbon dates from wheelhouse two to once again match the independent interpretation of the phasing that Lisa derived from her archival analysis. This model, unfortunately, does not run. It has poor agreement, so right now we cannot make any conclusions from, from this model. Model three does not use any sort of sequencing of the radiocarbon dates and just interprets them as more generally reflecting the timing of each wheelhouse. Model four does the exact same thing, but it interprets both wheelhouses as belonging in the same phase of continuous activity. So in this scenario, they would have to be contemporaneous or immediately sequential. So I would like to quickly provide some interpretation to the modeling results. So when comparing on the right, which are the best probabilities for the, found date, the timing of the start of activity at the settlement, you can see that these probabilities are more or less the same. One observation is that the probabilities for the start of wheelhouse one and wheelhouse two are also extremely similar. A takeaway from this is that model four provides the most precise probability. Likewise, similar observations can be made about our probabilities for when activity ended at the settlement. All the models provide really similar results. Once again, model four is the most precise and wheelhouse one and wheelhouse two appear to have activity at these two wheelhouses appears to have ended at about the same time. Because model four is offering the most precise probabilities, and because other models justify some of the assumptions of model four, this is our preferred model for interpretation. And when just quickly comparing the spans of use that derive from each of the models, once again, they're more or less the same, and model four provides the most precise estimate. So looking at just the results from model four alone, you can see a site history shown here which estimates that both wheelhouses were constructed in the second century BC and that activity associated with them ended around the first century AD. Another finding from model four is the spans of each of the wheelhouses shown here. The model estimates that both wheelhouses more or less were used for the exact same amount of time. And we can actually take that a step further and look at the number of human generations that the two wheelhouses were used for. And at 68% probability, this model estimates that they were used from about 120 to 200 years. If we assume a human generation is about 30 years. This is from four, this, would, this estimates that these were used for four to seven human generations. So now we're able to look at the uh, timing of everything at, at a generational scale. So just some quick concluding points about our research program thus far. We think that these results in this study should show you all that artifacts and legacy collections, even if poorly documented, have immense value to provide really innovative scientific chronologies that can provide new understandings of history at a really fine scale. Another take home point is that the chronology of Ruth Akatuith right now suggests that this wasn't just one wheelhouse built in isolation and then another one built to replace it. Rather, these were contemporaneous and this was, they were part of a larger community. So this, these results are now going to drive our future research. We're really interested in doing more excavations at this settlement to really try to see, was this a thriving, Iron Age community, what else is there? 
And also, we're really interested in maybe doing more analyses of other wheelhouse villages and sites in Scotland for chronological comparison. So thank you, everyone. Here are our acknowledgments. Oh,